Um, this is our session on work. It's our first session thinking where we have concrete presentations of, of tactics and, and, uh, and practices in a way. Um, uh, it's a session about work and how we build solidarity across uh, differences somehow. We started speaking about this already at the end of our last um, session and our last public event last Wednesday for those who were here. So in a way we're really picking up from there in a nice way. Um, and obviously when we speak about work, um, we, we, um, we know that work can mean many things. We don't mean only wage labor when we say work. So we know that definitions of work are contested and we like to think about all the forms of invisible work, reproductive work, uh, you know, uh, mental load work, care work, and so on, that also go into uh, agriculture. Um, so when we talk about work, we talk about a lot of different things that can also sometimes be in tension with each other and um, be ambivalent. Uh, and we have, um, yeah, we have three collectives presenting today that talk about different aspects of work, uh, collective work, waged work, organizing work, uh, um, and also worker struggles. So I think we're gonna, like it, the term will become quite rich. Um, and when we were interested in a way in practices that overcome sort of alienations or separations between different uh, forms of work uh, in different ways. This is why we have invited those people to speak and we know that all of you have a lot to say about that too. Um, so we'll go into breakout groups in the second hour of the session and have more of a conversation together. Um, so we're interested in, you know, the breaking down of separations between waged and unwaged work, um, between uh, documented and undocumented work, productive and reproductive work, um, seasonal farm work and peasant farm work. How do we organize across those, um, you know, feminized work and so-called men's work, uh, clean work and dirty work. I mean, it's an endless list of different different kinds of separations of types of work, industrial work versus self-organized work, or also care work uh, and earth care work, which we also really like to think together. Those of us that have listened to our podcast, the Earth Care Fieldcast, um, will, have, will, will know that. Um, and so one of our key starting points is the kind of refusal to separate uh, those kind of utopian practices that are sometimes described as, you know, prefigurative or alternative, does this kind of labor of setting up alternative infrastructures and so on, the world that we want to create, we want to, we want to refuse the separation of, of that from struggle within the system, the industrial system, you know, the kind of the capitalist system, those labor struggles um, that are so important for changing conditions, you know, within within the capitalist system also. So this is like uh, one of those key, key things that I think we'll hear a lot about today. Just to quickly also share with you uh, the kinds of questions that we bring to this session and to the course overall, because we don't have any magic answer to how to overcome those various, uh, you know, tensions, contradictions, and uh, sometimes ambivalences between different ways in which we're situated in one, in within one form of work or one form of practice or the other. Um, we've written as an organizing team some open questions together, to which we don't have the perfect answers, but we like to walk with questions in a way, and. Um, I think uh, Laura and Nadine will read them out now briefly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the questions you can walk with with your collectives are, how do we create spaces to do things together across differences? How do uh, we yes, the next one uh, that we ask is how do we build power transver transversally? And how do we situate ourselves without guilt and work with privileges and oppression? And the next question that we propose to you, how do we feel, how do people build charity? And how do we establish a common interest across different situations? How do we avoid victimization, objectification, Journalism. How do we recognize differences and contradictions without getting caught in binarisms or rigid identities, such as 
urban, rural, white, black, working class, middle class, local, non-local, man, woman. We want to do all of this capturing the complexity of intersecting oppressions. How can we open to one another without fear or mistrust? How can we cultivate the climate of listening to understand where people are coming from without judging them outright. And finally, how can we support and protect each other as we experience discrimination and exclusion? And finally, number two, how can the multiple subjectivities and subalternatives produced in agroecological transitions deal with power and care. So that's some of our starting questions, staying with the trouble and the uh, open, openness of those questions. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing our um, those three collectives tell us about how they approach some of these questions. I think they have different approaches, each of them, to those questions. And that's incredibly rich because, um, as I said, we don't believe that there's one right answer to any of this. Um, so just before we go into the presentations, just one point for you to know already in advance. We're going to go uh, first uh, with the presentations. That will be the first hour of our course. And then we will go into breakout groups where you will be able to pick the breakout group you want to go into. And um, we thought we would tell you in advance which ones they are, because sometimes that's useful to know. There will be one about um, feminist and anti-racist social syndicalisms. And that will be the one that has a Spanish translation also in the main room. There will be one on creating livelihoods, labor market access and equitable cultures. And there will be one about setting up grassroots unions. Um, we're going to reintroduce them later. But just so you know, if you develop specific desires for discussing one or the other thing, uh, that's what you'll be invited into later. Um, and maybe without too much further ado, I will introduce. Um, first up, we're going to have Conaleras de Huelva and Lucha. Then we'll have La Bolina. And then we will have Salt. Amazingly, um, it's many people in each of those presentations. Um, so I would first pass the mic to uh, Jornaleras de Huelva and Lucha, who will speak in Spanish. So if people need translation from Spanish to English, this is the moment to hit that uh, interpretation button in the bottom and go to English. Then you can hear Maggie translate them. Um, super excited to have you here, and um, yeah, over to you. Thanks so much. Looking forward to learning from you. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Ana, and here I'm with my companion Sandra, who's working since a, for about a month with us. She speaks in Moroccan. She's going to be our new translator. Thank you very much for inviting us to uh, participate in this course. And thanks to Common Ecologies for organizing it and, and inviting us. We couldn't attend the presentation session last, last week because we're in the middle of the campaign. Right now, we've got a huge amount going on because we're just starting. And right now we have our union activities uh, for providing information. We're making videos this year for our campaign. And so for the, the season, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Jornaleras de Huelva en Lucha, that is uh, day laborers of Huelva in struggle, arose out of a group of uh, of field laborers from various different countries. Uh, we're all working in one company doing agricultural work. And in 2018, when uh, 
issues of sexual and labor abuses uh, against Moroccan companions of ours were revealed. They came out through European media. They were published by Buffett News. Uh, Stefania Brandi uh, told in various different articles what was going on here in a major uh, journalistic uh, research project, which uh, sort of raised a great outcry, but also the workers themselves were starting to denounce uh, the company uh, for what was going on here. We, some of us, have also experienced uh, abuses because here in the countryside, in the past, we earned very little, but we worked comfortably. But uh, in recent years, we're being treated like animals, like cheap labor with a lot of abuses being pushed to produce a huge amount at a great speed. And there are some places where they don't allow you to speak to the companion that's next to you. There are some countries that require that you sign this as rules before you start working for the season. So we taking advantage of the courage of our companions, we rallied and we decided also to denounce our, our company to report everything that was going on, especially regarding our Moroccan uh, the abuses to our Moroccan uh, companions, but also all of the other policies that we didn't agree with. When a group of companions decided to escape from the uh, company they were working with, they had been protesting and they were locked up so they could be deported to Morocco. And in an interview with another Moroccan companion, we were just learning we had no idea that we were going to end up in all of this. We were just learning how to do this. And we came together with her and we felt so identified with what was happening, even though we didn't speak the same language, even though we came from very different situations. We said, here, we have to organize ourselves. We have to get together in order to do something and fight for our rights together. So Right then, uh, there was a union, the SAT, the Andalusian Workers Union, that uh, noticed us, that offered us all their support, that said that they would work as our uh, sort of our umbrella organization, that we were real fighters, that they saw that we knew what we were doing, that we were uh, real fighters here in the countryside. And I decided that since this was a historical uh, union that I admired and I had always followed their work, I decided, okay, with great enthusiasm, I entered into that union to see what was going on there. And they offered to carry out a, a, a union campaign. I had already lost my job uh, because I was, uh, because I had protested all the doors were closed to me and so much was going on. There was so much uh, visibility uh, that all doors to regular farm labor were closed to me. And so they offered uh, me that I work within the union to do the union campaign. They proposed to us, uh, it was like a work offer. They said, you're going to have this, you can have access to a car, you'll have legal counsel, you know your way around on the on the ground, you can work however you want to, etc. You can, you know, inform people of their rights, uh, etc. And be able to uh, make uh, re reports to the, uh, the labor inspectors. Now, I had done a training course in Almeria and I learned what how unions worked. I didn't know anything about that until that moment. I understood how uh, union elections work because until that moment, we those simply hadn't existed in the kind of workplaces that I had worked in through my whole life. So I started with great excitement. I wanted people to get involved. I wanted people to uh, get committed because I had never, I never thought of myself as a unionist that was, you know, sitting in an armchair 
uh, trying to fix the situation for people and then go back to my armchair. You no, know, I, what I wanted to do was for my companions to get together and to fight together for our rights. I wanted people to understand that we have rights and that there were tools that we could use. So it was right when I started doing all of this within the union, the SAT, a group of older men who have who haven't experienced uh, work in the strawberry fields in Huelva started to stop us and say, what were we doing? We were crazy that we couldn't do it that way. That's, that's not how things are done. And that what we had it to do was to, to just hand out uh, uh, know your rights pamphlets and, and uh, make reports to the labor inspectors. And I didn't agree. And so secretly we, uh, we, we called for a, a union elections. We presented a group of workers from one of the companies around here and it was huge. They, they, there was a giant uh, up, uproar within the union and ultimately the union left us abandoned. And so we had to work on our own. That was hard at the time, but actually it, it, now we're grateful for it because we learned so much, but it was a very unpleasant situation at the time. They started to mistreat us, to threaten us within the union itself. So that was a really hard period uh, for all of us. So I decided to leave the union, to cut off any relationship with them and that from there forward, we were just gonna have to do it ourselves. So in 2020, since the resources we had were very little, we were basically doing all this work when we got home from our own jobs. At that time, I was earning the 250 euros a month that I was getting from unemployment and we just forged ahead. So thanks to a journalist from Huelva, uh, Perico Echevarria, Echevarria, we called him and said, this is what's going on in this company. And then Perico would call the company. The company would be frightened that he was going to publish something in the, in the local magazine. And thanks to that, uh, we got them to actually pay uh, the workers that they readmit workers that were being uh, fraudulently fired. And when I ran out of unemployment benefits, I, I was going to have to leave. But thanks to the cooperative of Andalusian lawyers, they offered me to work in a union campaign in which I really would have full liberty to do things however I wanted to do them. And it was going to allow me to organize myself with my other companions in the field uh, together with what by then we were calling for two years, I was the only one working in that office together with uh, Maria from Malaga. And then uh, the next year we managed to pay also Najat. And at that point we created our own association. We built our own autonomy. And in 2021, we did a crowdfunding that allowed us People gave us 30,000 euros, which was an amazing sum for us. We're cr tremendously grateful for that. And that trust that people placed in us allowed us to go from when that contract ended with the cooperative to start in, in September of 2021 to the present. And right now we're obtaining because the crowdfunding is now over, we needed a new source of funding and we requested money from a private fund, which is the Guerrilla Foundation. And just a couple of um, months ago, they approved 20,000 euros for us. And so right now we can carry out this, this work until December of 2023. And what we do is what the unions don't do, the unions that abandoned us, provide information, especially that, so that people 
know their rights because there's still things I'm just learning about thing rights that I have that I had no idea about. We learn along the way, we sign up for lots of courses, we do uh, legal counsel, uh, our, our lawyers get paid by Intermon Oxfam. And so we're, we're learning as we go. We're learning a lot from each other, from our companions, from our colleagues. And right now we can say that we are the principal uh, union force right now in Huelva working for the uh, farm workers' rights. It, our, our, our struggle is reaching lots of different places, both within Spain and, and internationally. In the months that there isn't work in the fields here, we uh, have been traveling around giving talks in Spain and, and abroad. Lately, we've been invited a lot to uh, high schools, local high schools, where we've been, the kids at those schools very likely are going to end up working in the fields around here. And so it's very important that they be familiar with all of this. So we do training, we provide information, we take courses and we give courses. And also we do political impact work. Advocacy, we've been working with the Ministry of Work. Thanks to that contact, uh, we've we've got a direct contact with the Labor Inspection Board for Huelva. And that's going to allow us to work much better having a direct uh, relationship with the labor inspectors. So that is who we are and where we come from. And when we're in the small groups, we can tell a little bit more about our current situation in greater detail because there are a lot of different perspectives. There's not just one situation for one single class of field laborers. Within that class, there are very different specific situations depending upon where each worker is from and, and other aspects of their situation. So thank you again for having us and it's a, a delight to be with you all today. Thank you, Anna. I will give one second so Maggie can catch her breath. <laughs> Eh, Perdón, Maggie. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to remember <laughs> slowly. Um, yeah, just to say, uh, we also have the Collective Mujeres 24 is also with us in this course, is also uh, in and around Huelva and, um, you know, very much working also with uh, the jornaleras and um, will also be in the breakout group later on syndicalism and we actually also have another campaign working in France on seasonal um, agricultural workers rights which is um, Code Tras um, which we'll also have in the breakout group so it's pretty exciting that um, we have some serious uh, representation of uh, groups organizing around this here and I've also posted some links in our chat uh, to videos and podcasts we've made with yet other campaigns in Austria and Switzerland and so on. So feel free to tune in. And cool if you keep questions already coming on the chat, uh, we will gather them for the big discussion later. But now I hand over to Laura. Hola, muchas gracias, eh, Ana. Thank you. Thank you, Ana, Sandra, and everyone that's here. I'm very pleased to present La Bolina. With us today are Maria, Ruth, James, and Ernest. Is that right? Please say, say hi so we can see you. Salma is also here. Right, so of course, of course. Sorry, Salma is also with us. And Maria. We're here with La Bolina. La Bolina is an association located in the valley just south of Granada, also in Andalusia. So we're going from Huelva to Granada. 
over the last five years, they've promoted uh, regeneration, sustainability, and social integration in uh, in villages that have been depopulated. They focus on support and facilitation to regularize the situation of migrants and refugee persons in this area, providing dignified work through uh, community supported agriculture. We're very delighted to hear their experience. So I'll pass the floor to them. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Firstly, for inviting us and uh, yeah, for organizing this amazing, amazing course. Um, so, firstly, I, I, I would uh, tell you how we are going to or why we are going to explain. So, we will go through a little bit of what we have been doing as La Bolina. Um, uh, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit of how we have been working together and the challenges in terms of uh, anti-racist anti practices and uh, engaging with diversity amongst our group, and then how those uh, learnings have um, collided into a project that is now working uh, in Almeria, uh, working with the people that is working there in the in the plastic sea. So, so I'll, I'm going to share. Uh, can I share my screen? Could you give me the right to do that? And, and we will be talking uh, amongst us so, so you can hear a little bit uh, from each other's perspective. Should work now. Okay. Uy. Perfecto. Ahí se ve la pantalla. Okay. Yeah, wait a minute. Because I want to, I know, slideshow. Yeah, great. So <clears throat> first is to say that uh, La Bolina was born uh, to kind of like give, um, uh to offer to showcase and experiment with a different way uh, of responding to some of the interlocking challenges that that are uh, that um that relate migration food production and consumption and also um yeah so like for example the cases that are happening there in in in, in Huelva and, and our resp an alternative response to what is happening in Almeria. No? How can we bring together migration, agroecology, regeneration of rural areas in a different, in a, in a different way, a, 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 uh, applying to a different way of uh, organizing, but also a different way of understanding, um, of understanding the, 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 the system itself, no? creating an alternative. So, so La Bolina has, um, yeah, so, sorry, and also to say that in the ways we, not only what we have done, so creating alternative livelihoods around agroecological production in the rural areas of Spain, this could summarize what we wanted to do. Also, we have explored different ways of doing it, so organizing differently, so moving from an institutional kind of approach to a more community approach, uh, more based on uh, horizontal practices, uh, more based on participation and uh, yeah, and equity and friendship. You know? So this is also contesting the ways in which uh, big organizations are are working with migration. So so we have been a, a, a team, a, a diverse team uh, from different parts of the of the world that have have come from La Bolina and it has been changing throughout the years. Uh, some of the, the the ways in which we approach what we do, what we did, uh, some of the key strands, let's say, was firstly we focus on on creating the capacities to work on agroecological and permaculture practices, and also about commercialization. What it meant to have like short, uh, short circles of commercialization. I don't know if that's the English word, uh, so that we could um, uh, produce. Uh, produce uh, food uh, and create systems of production and consumption in the in the in the area around the area so we created this this uh, a program called uh, cultivando futuros futuros uh, cultivating futures that lasted like around 6 months and from there we started to get to know uh, people that have migrated that were interested in maybe engaging in in in, in land production through agroecological practices 
So we we get offered a couple of pieces of land, um, one in the in the rural area where we were uh, based, uh, given by the council, and other given offered by a mezquita close to to Granada. So so we started creating a scheme through which we could uh, cultivate the land, but also commercialize it. Uh, and the way we decided to do that was creating a veg box scheme, uh, so that we could uh, sell our uh, fresh local and seasonal production, but also uh, process products that were produced not only by La Bolina, but also by, by local producers which, with which we also wanted to collaborate. So because the idea of the project was also to, to work with local, local producers and, and uh, create this kind of um, cooperative uh, or cooperation amongst uh, migrant producers, local producers to, to, to bring about these alternative ways of uh, consuming and producing food. <clears throat> Briefly, I'm going to say we, we went through different models because uh, I, I, I like what you said, uh, Manuela, about one is the utopian practices and then you face reality. So our first, uh, I'm going to talk about the second module. Uh, uh, so sorry, model uh, that we that we wanted to put in practice. And this second model uh, wanted to create a cooperative uh, with local, uh, local producers and migrant producers so that we could offer land and uh, tools for people to produce uh, food in, in their own, at their own rhythm, uh, produce the, the food that they wanted to, sorry, the, the vegetables or the, 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 um, the crops that they wanted to and, and collide into a, a system, a commercializing system that was La Bolina, so that, so that, uh, so that uh, th this cooperative model uh, was horizontal and and everyone had the everyone was their own boss, and everyone could contribute uh, in, in the decision making processes of the of the cooperative. So this model didn't work for some for many reasons. One was um, it's, it's very difficult or nearly impossible to gain your legal status through uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneurism. So through uh, being an entrepreneur and working your own piece of land, it's, it's very difficult to get your papers because what you need to get your papers is a job offer for a, for a year and a full-time uh, job, job offer. Secondly, if you don't have those basic needs covered, uh, engaging in particip participatory processes, engaging in entrepreneurial activities was uh, something that we didn't see people very interested in. So it's as if in order to create alternatives for the system, first you have to have the rights within the system to kind of like contest them. So, so this, this cooperative model didn't work and we focused then more into cre creating a sustainable uh, business so that we could employ people. And the idea was uh, to employ people, but not only to build the skills on land production or commercialization, but also uh, decision making, how to make decisions collaboratively, uh, how to speak in public, to give talks and give trainings to others. Uh, how to mentor other migrants that could come and start working in the, in the land so that we we didn't build only these capacities but also wider capacities for people to take leadership roles later on in the future. Some of the challenges that we are finding with this model and I'm going to finish with that is um, uh, there is there is there is um, Sustain economic sustainability is one challenge. So when you need to um, create uh, create job positions in the conditions of the system, you need to gain a lot of money with your, your badge box scheme so that it's sustainable. And this is a, a challenge that we have gone through. And, and, se and secondly is how do we visibilized the activist economy that you talked about before, like what happens with all the, the time that you have to put into in, in participating to create awareness, to, to, to create awareness on, your, on, your, uh, on the public that is gonna consume your, your, your vegetables. Um, what happened with the care economy as well. So the caring systems that we have had to put in place in order to work with people that were, have different needs. And, and yeah, that difference between the wage work and what is what we can consider other kinds of work, no? 
So that's a very interesting conversation that we can take take uh, later on in the groups. But then, <clears throat> secondly, and I'm going to pass it to Ernest, uh, is I think our our um, our initiative is interesting in in the sense of how do we work together in a diverse uh, within a diverse group that we were conforming. So we were people with from different. Uh, we had different status, we had different backgrounds, cultures, race, genders, etc. And and working, uh, trying to work in participatory horizontal ways was uh, challenging and also uh, a learning space for, for all of us. So Ernest, if you wish to, to continue explaining how that went for us. Um, thank you, Maria. Um, I'm, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on um, some of the challenges we have um, faced as a project. Um, I mean, today a lot of people are talking about La Molina or they, like, they are really inspired about La Molina, but um, to be where, like, where we are today is because of some of the challenges that we have like, gone through and come together as a team to be able to work collectively and then find solutions. And um, uh, one thing, like in terms of the challenges we we, we found was um, who divide participation as a project of different um, people is is a very diverse uh, group, as Maria said. Um, we find it in the beginning very difficult of like who divide what participation means because, like for example, uh, in the West uh, where. Um, if people want like a more participatory way of like communicating or discussing things, we form it in a circle. That was that was also like um, a barrier to other people with different culture, where they find it very difficult to talk when people are in circle. So, these are some of the things uh, we we encounter or we face during during uh, the beginning of the project. Um, another challenge in also that we 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 also face uh, in the project is. Um, like transportation and access to resources, influence, power, and, and participation. Uh, what this actually means is like um, for most of the migrants that we are around living in the valley where the project is based, uh, people that know here will tell you how transportation, uh, uh, how difficult transportation is um, to go to the city or to come back to, the, uh, to this place. So migrants have to rely on project members or other ways of means to be able to like deal with their uh, uh, paperwork. And um, most of the time, I can say they have to rely on project members who have cars or who can drive them. And this actually influence their participatory in the sense like, if, if that is a mistake or if that is something they, they want to like complain to a project member who is helping them like in trans transporting, transporting them to do their legal aspect, then it becomes like, a, a more challenging thing because they can say uh, actually what is inside them because of they have that fear of if I want to say this, this person may prevent me of uh, some of these uh, uh, some of the things his EOC is helping me with. Um, and another thing also is like um, there is this uh, assumptions among the people where people see like the more you participate in the project, the more things you do. That is how you get uh, power. And like people that we are not doing a lot or that in the beginning could not do a lot, find themselves like as power, powerless people in the project. So they don't have a lot to say. And um, another also fundamental thing uh, the, the project also faced with some uh, uh, is like some of the migrants seeing like some of the people also in the project who are like more responsible for funding uh, that are bringing in funding or writing. Uh, 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 funding proposals and all these kind of things, they see them as powerful people and it, it, it was also very difficult for them to challenge those people in the fear that if they challenge them, then maybe there will be no resources coming in in terms of money to support them. And um, that is also like um, uh, a challenge in, 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 in the, between the land, people working on the land and also people working in the office in the sense that um, there is an assumption uh, within the people on the land thinking like they are working more than the people in the project uh, in the office because they see the office as like 
a more luxury, a luxury way of like, you know, working, you are there in the office with, the, with your computer, you're not doing hard work and all these kind of things. And also people in the office thinking also the other way are like, it is, it is, it is sunny outside. There are people working on the land, you know, they are doing activities, they are moving all around. So there have been like some kind of conflicts within these two um, uh, uh, team in the, in, the, in the project. And um, another thing is also like, um, yes, um, our common language in the project uh, was like one common official language was English and Spanish, but like um, we, are, we all come from different, different areas and our understanding of these two language differs. So sometimes um, when message is being sent or email is being sent, the way people interpret the message or the way they receive it, uh, sometimes is different from what the actual context of the message really mean. So there have been like communication breakdowns and, 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 and also conflict arising uh, within, within this context. And uh, I mean, there are more and more because of time, uh, just summarize a little bit. Um, if you look at all these challenges, um, time and resources are the things that are needed to be able to prevent this, uh, to prevent these challenges uh, from coming, uh, I mean, causing conflicts. But in certain scenarios, that time and resources was never there. Like I can say time and resources were, not, were never there and this uh, lead to what, uh, this lead to conflict within, within the project. And, um, there have been like different conflicts that have arise in the projects. And like um, one thing uh, about the project is whenever like there are conflicts, we normally come together and try to settle, uh, come and like work out how we can stop the conflict. Uh, some of the ways we have used to prevent like conflicts happening is um, making check-ins uh, within, within the group. Um, if people also feel like check-in was not enough, there were like body pairs where we pair uh, people like so they can also like go away like people you someone you feel confident with that you can share and share like your doubts your worries uh, some of the things you're not happy about the project so like I mean if you are like confident in talking to one person then we form like a pair where people also say and these people can come back to the whole group and give out like um, a feedback and and also like sometimes after after conflicts after like, you know, very heated conversation and all these kind of things, we normally come together like cooking and dancing and partying. I think this has something that uh, was really alive in the project. And I believe it has also keep the project, you know, moving rapidly, like very fast. Um, because yeah, we there are, there are different, different ways. So as I said, like there have been challenges and also like there have been like uh, uh, very good things and advantages that the project has also offered to migrants and, and other people. And like there have been like learning, learning moments. So learning from our challenges. <clears throat> so first of all, it's like the project has moved from what we from equality to equity because um if we talk about equality, yes, like everybody has been treated equally and everything. But if you look at our status, we are working with people from different areas. You know, there are migrants, there are people from the West. There are people from other places. So if you look at our status, our gender, and uh, of our economic, it's completely different. So how do we bring equity into play? So like the project tried to do that, like moving from equality to equity. Thanks. And um, the project also has tried to listen uh, to migrants because it has seen like, to make these people uh, feel like who we have to listen to them. Because when we listen to them, they will feel that they will have that confidence to be able to like um, participate more. Or from listening, also you can know the capability or the the, the 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 power of that individual who is speaking to you. What is he good at, and what is he weak, he or she weak at? So like uh, the project has provided that space to listen to people, so they can know their capabilities, and uh, so they can also feel belong to the project. And um, there have been also like uh, a, a cultivation of sense of belonging where, as I said, everybody was treated equally. And um, this has enabled migrants to feel home or safe 
within within the project because you see your your co-worker as a family member a sister or a, or a brother because of like how welcoming the project has been and um yeah um i think this one is a very fundamental thing uh the project is well known for um, uh creating livelihood through ag ag uh, agriculture and permaculture but it doesn't end there uh, the project labolina has also tried to create training so uh, training in different in different areas like leadership training for migrants so like they can learn the ag ag uh, agroecology or permaculture aspect of growing food and also learn leadership skills where at some point if they leave the project they can be able to start their own things or whenever they go somewhere else they can stand for themselves they can speak for themselves and um typical a very important example or typical example uh, is um today uh, me and my colleagues as James and uh, Ruth uh, and uh, Selma we were able to like uh, start a project in Almeria because of some of the leadership training we have like uh, learned from from this project so this has given us like that confidence that skills to be able to like start something new with other people that are yeah that are also like very interested in my in 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 migration and and yeah agroecology or permaculture so from here i pass it to um selma um uh we've we're really running out of time just so you know um selma if you're coming on uh yeah I can I can uh, make it very quick, and you can also give me a sign when. Or do you want me to to completely um, uh, skip this part? I would say maybe just do it in a nutshell and in the breakout room. Maybe you can go back to it in the round of introductions, um, just because uh, we're losing now time for the breakout rooms already, and we have one more presentation. Yeah. So maybe just kind of summarize it, and then people know that in the breakout room they should go to, to yeah. the one where you're in. Okay. Um, so I uh, had the luck to encounter uh, Ernesto, James and Ruth and we're together working on uh, a project in Almeria now, which is a, a region comparable to Huelva. It's also large scale agriculture and therefore large scale exploitation of both uh, humans and, and nature. Um, and we started this project actually resonating with the questions you are we're just uh, posing as, and, uh, as points of departure, like how do we create spaces to do things together across differences? How do we build power transversely? Um, so we started this question, uh, this project with the question, who are we, like the four of us as a team in this context? And how do we position ourselves in a context that is not ours? Um, so actually our collaboration is already a an aim for to deconstruct in itself. Um, we or main methods are therefore uh, listening and accepting the feedback in order to um, decide what what our next steps um, will be. Um, I'll skip a bar, uh, part. I'll go to planting seeds. We're therefore like uh, connecting and collaborating with people who are in Almeria. Um, uh, for example, Fatima, uh, a Moroccan woman that works already there for, for more than eight years, and she wants to start um, a women's uh, organization. Um, esperamos como también uh, conectar con las jornaleras en lucha. Uh, we also hope to connect with uh, jornaleras en lucha uh, soon. We do have... Um, like uh, time in Almeria to actually see what's going on, on on the ground and what the needs are and how we can um, follow um, these needs and ideas instead of imposing something from the outside. Um, so therefore we aim to deconstruct um, power relations, uh, listening rather than talking, um, capacity building and empowerment and uh, we're very keen of alternative and create to uh, explore alternative and creative ways of learning knowing and amplifying messages from the fields um, and in all this this is like um, 
uh, departed from feminist and anti-racist uh, anti and decolonial um, encounters. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we will have more time in the breakout rooms later. I think most of you will be uh, in the breakout room that um, we called Creating Livelihoods, um, Labor Market Access and Equitable Cultures. So anybody knows that that's where this conversation can continue later. Um, thanks a lot. I will pass on now to Mariana to introduce our last speakers. Thank you, Manu. And thank you for, for the great presentation from Juan Arleras de Huelva y La Bolina. Um, I'm, I have the honor to present SALT. Here we are uh, with Hadi, Mil, and Sara, who are from SALT, short for Solidarity Across Land and Trades. It is a group of people coming together from within the agroecological sector in the UK. They started out sharing experiences about precarious working conditions, exploitation and discrimination in the sector, asking how can sustainable agriculture be sustainable for both the non-humans and the humans. SALT is now an emerging grassroots trade union organizing for fairer conditions, solidarity, care and justice for workers across the land related trades. Their aims are setting up a sector branch within an existing union, offering mediation, legal support, advice and guidance, and building workers' powers and solidarity to improve the sustainability of land-based livelihoods. So thank you very much for being here today with us. And yeah, we are happy to hear from your experience. Hi, everyone. I'm Nell. Um, I'm a member of SOLT. Uh, I'm also here with Harry, Mills and Sarah and Dot as well. Um, so thank you so much for inviting us here. This is really exciting to be involved. And um, those last two presentations were just, yeah, really great. So thanks for those. Uh, we're right at the beginning of our unionizing process. Uh, so we're really excited to be here to kind of learn from some strategies for organizing from the more established groups. Um, so as we just said, we're a grassroots union. We formed at the beginning of last year. And we're trying to fight for, for work, fairer working conditions for workers across all land trade in the UK, uh, primarily within the agroecological sector. So we joined to unionise against the prevalence of burnout, exhaustion, badly paid and unpaid work, working without a contract, long hours, uh, bogus self-employment, poor living conditions, isolation and discrimination. So the conversations around unionising started at the end of 2021 and they kind of came from a few different places but one of the really key inspirations was a, was a report about the accessibility of the agroecological farming sector for black and people of colour workers and they really highlighted the need to build a union to improve the working conditions. Um, and so this report was one of the kind of initial really key pushes, like this is the time to unionize. But there has also been throughout the sector a real kind of burgeoning realization that poor working conditions are really, really rife across the agro agroecological sector. And that there's been a real neglect of talking about workers' rights within sustainability and within the movement in general. So there were some isolated attempts at unionizing. Uh, some of which were successful, but there was a desire to provide a more kind of national unified body. And the collective was really small initially, only about three people. Um, and we held a few talks at some farming events talking about workers' rights. And in these talks, one of the key issues started to be highlighted, which is the tension between talking in spaces where they're both our employers and employees, which happens quite a lot in agroecological sector in the UK. And that's a lot of that is due to the kind of informality of work and that is not always clear kind of who is an employer in that space. Um, so specifically, this has happened within kind of middle management roles when they've also had a lot of issues going on um, and also within like non hierarchical cooperatives. And that's been like a key confusion for us as we've been progressing over the last year. Um, so in these events, they are pretty well attended. And from that, we held an open meeting and then the coordinating team kind of began to be established from that meeting. Um, and we have, yeah, weekly 
weekly meetings for that and there's about six of us who meet in this capacity weekly and capacity within our group is strong but does also ebb and flow as well and so that's like the resources and times everyone works full time that's like yeah we're all volunteers it's that's definitely a difficulty for us um so we posted two pretty successful workshops at agroecological events last year and in them we kind of focus on this like concept of consciousness raising where we were really trying to just really focus on talking to other workers sharing our struggles building solidarity like getting people to understand their rights and move their kind of personal private difficult experiences into like a more political realm to start thinking about what can we do to change these things um and we've got an ongoing workers inquiry which at the moment is a survey uh, which we've got online and trying to promote around um yeah hopefully you're going to build on that gathering and sharing information throughout this year um and we've also got an, an upcoming event in July where we're going to be yeah canvassing more ideas for the workers inquiry and getting more data in the sector trying to learn from other grassroots organizers um so what have been our our successes so yeah the consciousness raising has been really great we've had members talking about how they felt really validated when they've shared stories and heard them reflected back to them and it really feels like we are part of the move of, of a movement in the sector and that kind of keeps building and growing and people are responding really well to what we're talking about um yeah and in these sessions just kind of learning our rights as much as we can understand them because it's such a kind of informal complicated sector that's also been kind of challenging for us even to really understand what our rights are as workers um so excitingly we've started to build solidarity with people that are in the agroecological agro sector which is great so in our most recent workshop there were some people from the conventional farming sector um which was really good and we're really wanting to try and bridge these gaps and that's like a key a key question to talk about today um so our collective decision making has also worked pretty well and that's been like using polls to audit the members particularly when the capacity in the coordinating group has ebbed at times um and yeah we're all kind of learning how to collectively facilitate and organize these like kind of quite complex spaces and discussions um and really learning together which feels like that's that's quite a strong thing at the moment so what's been hard yeah the complexity of the jobs in the agroecological sector is definitely been a key challenge um and trying to work out who the union's for like who are we and who are we yeah who are the workers that we're advocating for um and yeah where middle management fits in that and cooperatives it's just yeah still kind of an ongoing discussion and grappling with employment law as well has been really complicated and confusing um the diversity and the complexity of needs across different jobs and roles in the sector um, has meant there's just like a lot to talk through it isn't like one unified experience at all um so reaching workers building membership is difficult because people are often isolated they don't always have access to internet or phone signals working on their own uh, communities that aren't always likely to you know join online groups or fill out forms and related to that is the fact that we don't meet in person really very often at all we're a geographically dispersed group I mean still within the UK so not as much as some of the other groups but um yeah we're mainly in the south of the UK and we definitely need to increase our reach to the north and try and build on how to build capacity whilst working constantly online um we decided to affiliate with a larger union rather than create our own completely brand new union and that was in large part due to the fact that we don't have enough resources or resources or capacity from the coordinating group to create that from scratch and this decision has been one that's taken a lot from the group um as the sector doesn't have adequate union represent representation already we've had to do a lot of learning about which union would, would provide us with the best provision so that's just taken yeah a lot of our time and we're still in that process um yeah a key question for us is how to build solidarity with migrant workers in conventional agriculture in the uk and bridge those gaps into the conventional sector and that's something that we're yeah ongoing talking about and been a bit of a challenge for us 
So what we're doing now is that we've started the process of understanding how to affiliate. Um, we have our list of needs that we're still honing and working through, um, choosing to go through which, well, we've got a bunch of different unions and we need to, yeah, send out our list of needs and get them to respond to us with what they'd offer us as a branch of their union. Um, so yeah, we're co-authoring an article which talks about our reasoning for union unionizing. Um, and increasing our workers' inquiry and hopefully adding yeah more capacity into that in the in the next year, um, and yeah just starting to build our social media presence and trying to trying to build our fledgling membership base, um, and yeah that's it. Thanks. <laughs>